Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Welcome back. This is day two, new roles, buyer agency, what you must know now. Remember, this is day two. If you've not listened to uh, part one um, or day one of this series, make sure you go back and listen. And all of our notes, as always, are available, and there are a ton of notes, <laughs> are available exclusively on our um, our daily newsletter called harrisrealestatedaily.com. And harrisrealestatedaily.com is our free daily newsletter that includes all of our uh, show notes for that particular day, as well as a bunch of other exclusive um, content. So make sure you subscribe. It costs you nothing. harrisrealestatedaily.com. The link to subscribe is below. Use these notes for, you know, if you're an individual agent, obviously, for your own information, if you're broker or office manager. These are great um, notes and this podcast hopefully is going to help you educate all of your agents in anticipation of what's going to be a very confusing time as all this gets sorted out. Now, how confusing? It's one of the things Julie and I were debating over yesterday. And fortunately, some of you chimed in after yesterday's show, sent me emails and uh, you know texted us and whatnot, giving us some insight as to what your opinions were. So before I get to point number six, Julie, I want to reopen this can of whoop ass and let's <laughs> sure. let's try to understand this. Mm-hmm. All right, so there is an I think a big cloud over whether or not drip campaigns in the traditional sense, where you're sending new listing information to buyers, what the hell is going to happen with those? Because based on what we've been reading and based on what appears to be true, unless you know something that you haven't told me yet, it does appear that you are not going to, dear agent, dear broker, uh, essentially drip on folks you do not have some sort of formalized agreement with. Well, so this comes down, in my belief, to the definition of showings, virtual tours, seeing homes together, when it constitutes uh, representing the buyer or working with a buyer, all of these things have definitions to them, right? So if if my buyer, who previously didn't have any kind of specific written agreement with, I am sending via the drip some houses to show, does that mean that I am working with them, looking for houses for them? But Technically, I am. Didn't you find NAR on NAR's actual website, it specifically said that if you're sending them house data information, as you just described, you are by definition working with them? What they said was, quote, searching for homes. Right. How do you define that? (laughs) Okay. And and where does that stop and start? Does searching for homes for them... Just because they got it from my drip, does that constitute that I am searching for homes because I set up the search for them? Or do I have to actually physically cross the threshold or have some digital uh, footprint of having sent them a virtual tour? These are all really crazy questions going on. And the other thing that kind of makes me mad about the settlement is that we're all being, in the interest of being more transparent, you know, we as coaches, as podcasters, and they as brokers and team leaders and agents are being forced to attempt to really understand all of this legal stuff and be subject to our interpretation of the legal things. One of our future podcasts is going to be more about how it's going to be enforced and what the potential fines are. I, I find that to be a little off-putting that, you know, that, that this is causing all this consternation. Well, it's disingenuous, to be honest with you, because yeah. it's, it's not making things more, it's not providing any sort of higher level of, you know, it's opaque as hell. It's way less transparent. Exactly. If more, It's more uh, hard to understand than it ever has been before. Mm-hmm. I mean, as you pointed out yesterday, Warren Buffett said, you know, he's never negotiated a commission before on all of his transactions because the system works. And why would you screw with a system that works? Well, evidently they didn't consult Mr. Buffett before they decided to make these changes, but we are merely your, you know, your humble podcast hosts and your coaches. We're certainly not experts. We're not attorneys. We are learning about all this stuff as we go. So have your eyes open, but I will suggest to you guys on August 17th of 2024, you're going to have to assume there's going to be frankly a hard stop to a lot of the ways that people have been doing business 
Um, I can only assume that's true because a lot of attorneys are going to advise the brokers and everyone else to overcorrect on the side of being super safe. And I think you're going to see a lot of these CRMs are going to put in place new widgets that are going to essentially allow consumers to click a box that's going to hopefully satisfy the concern about, you know, the uh, disclosures. I don't even know how to even verbalize what I'm trying to say. But the problem is that some of you have these big databases. That means you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to have all the people in the database. There's no grandfathering in. All the people you've been dripping on, even your centers of influence and past clients that you're sending updated CMAs to and updated listing information, they're going to have to have these agreements uh, signed. And what I think digitally will probably be sufficient. I can't see why it wouldn't. But this gives all of you a, you know, you have you know, 90 days to get your acts together with regards to this. And if I were you, if I were an office manager, a team leader, a broker, what I'd be doing is I tell all my agents to uh, go to your drip campaigns, call every single person, uh, qualify them or re pre qualify them, find out what their motivation is, pull out the best leads that you have in your system, especially those that are, you know, might be in as a buyer, but they actually have homes to sell. And then start really drilling down and giving those people the higher level of attention that they deserve. The days of the big databases and these big data dumps that agents and brokers have been doing, hoping and praying that when you have tens of thousands of people in your you know, database, that so one will occasionally bubble up to the top. It does appear effectively that those days might be over. Um, unless there's some kind of change that happens to the guideline and a new update from NAR, please heed this as a warning. Yes, this should be called the new agent and broker got to be talking to more people but being more specific act. Well, it is ironic, Julie, that um, really what this is doing, it's going to force people to become more proactive in their lead generation, Exactly. which is not to be at our own drum here. What we've been preaching for, you know, ever is that really let everyone else be passive. Let everyone else do the dripping and the texting and the emailing and the, you know, Facebooking and all the rest of it. And then the agents that are being proactive, picking up the phone, having meaningful conversations, um, those are the agents that are going to win. They've always won and they're going to win now even at a higher level because the other agents that have always been dependent on passive might very well be hitting a hard stop with those um, passive lead generation methods. Couldn't agree with you more. So let's get to our points. Point number six. Remember, this is part two of a two-part podcast series about this topic. Point number six. You do have to be transparent and very specific about the compensation part of your agreement. Yesterday, we talked about the fact that your agreement does not have to be an exclusive agreement. It just has to be an agreement. It's going to vary case by case, but you do have to be transparent and specific about the compensation part. As per the proposed settlement, which now, as of I think two days ago, was approved pending any um, further litigation, which could always happen. But as uh, the settlement, any compensation received by an agent or broker must be clearly specified in the written agreement with the buyer. The agreement must outline the exact amount or rate of compensation to be received or provide a method for determining this amount. However, the compensation must be, as they say, objectively ascertainable and cannot be left open-ended. Now, okay, let, let me do this real okay, quick, because Sorry. what does that mean? Objectively ascertainable, I think that means you have to understand what you read, and cannot be left open-ended. Now, this is important. The example they gave, for instance, stating that, quote, buyer broker compensation shall be whatever amount the seller is offering to the buyer is not permissible under the settlement terms because it's too open-ended. So don't be lazy and try to use this as a catch-all phrase. It won't fly. And I've already seen um, agents and brokers trying to use that language. So what you're saying is they can't simply say buyer broker compensation shall be whatever the amount the seller is offering to the buyer. They have to specifically say what the amounts are. Now, I'm going to give you a Okay. That's why I could do, isn't be, it? Be okay not knowing the answer to this question. That's fine. So just so I understand, yep. uh, you're telling me that these agreements mm -hmm. that have to be in place yep. when you are representing, working with a buyer, mm -hmm. has to also specifically dictate how you're going to be paid. Yep. So that is, again, imagine if you're an agent who's got a big CRM, who you're now going to have to go through and explain to them your value proposition, how much you're going to get paid. You guys better be calling all these folks and you better be converting them to real clients and you better be essentially getting those folks that are your best leads into these new agreements. And that is really where the rubber is going to meet the road. Do not wait. You do not have that much time. And you can't, you can't just say a blanket statement. I'm going to make whatever's being paid. That's not allowed because it's not specific enough. Isn't that crazy? Because that not that what most agents would go to, especially assuming that we're all going to do business as we always have? 
when doesn't that make sense? But you, and yet you can't do it. And the way this the way these types of things work, guys, is this not okay? All the rules are in place. It's August seventeenth. Oh no, it's much more complicated than that. There's going to be litigation. There's going to be more settlements. There's misunderstandings. Going to be misunderstandings. There's going to be more everything, and it's going to last months, if not years, as all of this gets drilled down and drilled down and drilled down even more. And then we're finally going to have something that everyone can understand on one piece, uh, one piece of paper. But we are a long way from that, evidently. Yes. Well, fortunately, we still have a few months left, but that's going to fly by quickly. Ju- Julie and I are calling this the All Coaches Employment Act, by the way. <laughs> exactly. Okay. <laughs> so staying on this idea or this the stipulation that you have to be transparent and specific, they state that furthermore, and I think this is really important for you guys to get, furthermore, the settlement stipulates that the compensation received by an agent or broker for brokerage services cannot exceed the agreed upon amount or rate outlined in the buyer agreement. This means that if your agreement specifies you are charging a flat fee, whatever that flat fee may be, $1,500, $5,000, doesn't matter. If you're charging a flat fee, but the listing that your buyer ultimately wants to buy has a whatever percent, say 3% buyer commission included, guess what? You're stuck making your flat fee. You cannot make more than what your agreement states. Okay, so I'm going to tell you where my mind went. Um, Julie and I used to sell real estate, and I have a feeling some of you are feeling a little overwhelmed right now. I'm going to give you a solution, if not the only solution. If you are not working with a broker, or if you are a broker and you don't have all this sorted out yet, if you're if you're with a national brokerage and they haven't arch told you this is the solution, you do have something to worry about because not only are you going to have to understand broker leader in your brokerage, not only are you going to have to understand how this works, you're going to have to get your agents to comply and get your agents to understand how it works. That is not easy. Like Julie and I get hired by brokerages sometimes, and one of the underlying reasons they hire us is because they want us to coach the agents to use their in-house tools, their CRMs, and their whatever. Agents who have been in the business for more than five seconds who are all of a sudden being told to fill out a whole bunch of new paperwork, they're going to, you know, I'm not going to say, they're not going to be that eager to do so because it's going to be changed that they're not going to like. And with these new agreements, they're actually going to be forced to have conversations that they're not used to having with buyers because when Julie said what you're charging, not charging to the seller, charging to the buyer, what you're charging, $1,500 flat fee, you're asking the buyers to sign an agreement where they're agreeing to pay you the 3% or the 2.5%. Again, this is all going to get worked out. So if you're not worth a brokerage like eXp that has already created all this paperwork for you to use, you do have a problem. And I will strongly suggest you get on this problem urgently. Brokers, office managers, team leaders, get this started out now. And if you guys need our help, if you want to talk uh, with us about joining us at eXp Realty, so you can actually be with a brokerage that's leading with the, you know, to solve for all these issues that we're going to have. And again, there's not just a resolution on the 17th of August. It's going to be an ongoing challenge. There's going to be weekly, if not monthly, updates to how this works. EXP Realty is the really, you know, frankly, it's a safe harbor for many of you. Big brokers is especially. If you're working with, if you're a broker of 1,000, 5,000 agents, you really seriously need to think about whether or not you really want to con- continue on your own as an independent because EXP Realty, for many of you, is going to be the next natural step. Let's have the conversation. Text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. There's no doubt in my mind if Julie and I were an independent brokerage or had a big team, I would at least seriously be considering essentially what you know moving up to EXP Realty would be all about. If you want to learn more about Julie and I's EXP Realty team, scroll down below in the show description and you can learn more about our group. All right. So remember, too, that uh, it's important to note brokerages are not restricted to having only one agreement with the buyer. You might have a one time showing. You might have, um, you know, a certain amount of time. And also that not every agreement, you're not going to have just one agreement that you use with every single buyer. Some buyers, you're going to say, you know, they only want to look in a certain zip code for a certain amount of time. Other buyers are going to be like, I'm looking all over the place. I want you to represent me, period. It's not going to be such a standard issue thing. Well, so here's a question. Sure. So if, you ha- if you're a listing agent and you have a buyer show up, we talked about this, and the buyer, does not, if the buyer doesn't want to be represented, because this could very well be where it goes, Sure. because the buyers are just going to be confused, frankly. Mm-hmm. And if the buyers choose just to go to listing agents directly, and that happens a lot in the upper end, that's pretty much normal behavior in upper end real estate, like really upper end. Um, you know, cause buyer buyers in that, you know, price range have bought and sold so many times, they're going to probably just want to go to the listing agent directly. Cause they kind of know the process themselves. Okay. So when that happens, 
like how is that going to be handled from the listing agent's perspective in the United States? I mean, what's going to happen with, okay, so I have someone show up in my life. They're unrepresented. Now, am I having to get a, a showing, a, a, you know, essentially a buyer agreement with these guys? Or are they going to show up in my life having brought a little form to them saying that they're not represented? Or do I have to get them to sign a form saying they're unrepresented and they don't want to work with me exclusively and they just want to see my house? It is going to be confusing. Yes, it absolutely is going to be confusing. And can you imagine, you know, that listing agent and we're all, we're still in a time of scarce inventory, right? So there's going to be multiple people wanting the same house at the same time. Now I, as a listing agent am in the unenviable position to not just have to sort out who's offering what and do are they you know contingent on things, but also what type of representation they have. What does that do to my job? Is it making it harder well, or easier? But listen to what Julie just said. So as a listing agent now, you're th- there's going to be so many variables because we think, and I think ultimately, by the way, all this is going to settle out to be virtually the same as the way it works now. Maybe it's going to take a year, but that's the direction it'll go. But as a listing agent, you're now going to have to take all the normal considerations when you're trying to choose which offer you're going to accept or who you're going to negotiate with. And you're also going to have to start looking at the buyer's agents are probably going to ask for whatever buyer agent commission that that buyer agreed to pay that buyer's agent. That's going to be uh, you know, part of the transaction, but it's going to be at, it's going to be fully disclosed and the buyer's going to have to ask for the seller to pay for it. And we think in many markets, the seller's going to agree to pay for it just like they always have. But it is very interesting because maybe the little what they're asking, the commissions are going to be different. And, and so this is this is just as I just am talking, I'm just thinking I haven't seen this as. So if you basically have an exclusive contract with a buyer, just mm-hmm. think this through, Julie. And the, your agreement was that the buyer's going to agree, your agreement with the buyer is the buyer's going to agree to you know compensate you 2%, let's say. Sure. Okay. And you're a listing agent. And you're getting all these contracts in to buy this house. Yep. And you're looking to see what, and and let's say every one of them is asking for the seller to pay. You're probably, if all other things equal, you're going to take the one that has the least amount of compensation to the buyer's agent. Probably. Yeah. And how is how is that even remotely uh, ethical, possibly? Um, you know, I think about from the buyer agent standpoint, are you putting your buyer at a disadvantage because of that? You kind of are. Yeah. Because you're not going to be chosen. You're not at the top of the list. And I just think that this more than anything, and I'm we're not attorneys, right? But I always go back to agency and the fiduciary responsibility you have to do what's right for your client. And this really messes with that on both sides. It really does. Well, ultimately where this goes to, if you think about this full circle and mentally close the loop, it's going to go to the simple fact the buyer's agents are going to have to have skills to present their value sure. proposition to the, the buyers, just as the listing agents have always had to do that. They're going to have to present their unique selling propositions. They're going to have to present why the buyer is going to want to work exclusively with them. They're going to have to show the value and they're going to have to explain all the different ways that they get paid. There's going to be variations of, you know, Julie and I have been coaching you guys to use a flexible fee commission on the listing side forever. There's going to be something similar in the buyer side. That's where all this is going to go. But the days of, you know, the pop tart agent, as it's been called lovingly, you know, I want to see this house at one, two, three Elm street. Boom. I'm out the door. I'm going to go show the house with no pre-qualification with no agency form signed with no sort of formal, anything done. Those days are over as of August 17th. Or you should have a one-time showing agreement that you don't walk across threshold until you've got. So we'll see. I think there's going to be a whole lot of new formage out there. But in the one-time showing agreement, if uh, that's the first time you're showing that house or showing a house to that buyer, right? There's going to be, I assume, where's the compensation? Right? Exactly. I know. In that one-time showing agreement, otherwise you're showing a house to a buyer where they might want to buy the house, but because without you, you. Be, <laughs> right? but you didn't uh, get them to sign disclose uh, where they're essentially saying what the they're going to pay you for opening the door and showing the house. Right. And does that mean that we magically default to some other situation? I don't know. This is all really fluid. Uh, So here's an easy one. How long do agents have to make these changes? Point number six. You've got until August 17th. You talked about if you're still flapping in the wind and you're really confused and you have no leadership from your brokerage, we can help you just reach out. Okay. Number seven. Here's another black hole. Who will be enforcing the changes? Now, this right here is, (laughs) I think, going to be the number one source of really funny memes (laughs) <laughs> on Instagram yeah. that, that some really creative real estate people are going to come up with. And I'm really looking forward to see what you guys are coming up with. So I'm, we're going to set it up. You know how police officers have to wear, wear body cams and you see sometimes see these things on social where, you know, somebody's arguing with a cop and, you know, all the rest of it. Well, are we going to body cam agents 
to prove the fact that they did get the paperwork signed at the right time. How are you actually in industry, real estate industry, you police organized real estate. Tell me how we're actually going to police agents getting these forms signed prior to showing houses. And I can only imagine there's going to be, unfortunately, buyers who are going to call agents up, who are going to ask for homes to be shown. The agents aren't going to follow these new laws, aren't going to have these pap this paperwork signed prior to showing the house. The buyer then might figure out a way to litigate that, saying they were, you know, whatever, harmed somehow because the uh, agent didn't actually get the paperwork signed prior to showing the house. Who knows? I mean, it is going to be a potluck of litigation. I 100% agree. But here is the official answer. Who will be enforcing the changes? Individual MLSs are responsible for enforcing these rules. Now, to your point, just how is that going to go about? But that was the extent of it. They That's it. That's it. That's all we got. They didn't say how. MLSs no. are going to be responsible for enforcing the rules. No. And you and I had talked about this on one of our walks uh, last week is you were asking like how like technically how could that happen now we you know we have a lot of forms that we have to do we have property disclosure agency disclosure all of these things termite and lead-based paint well how is that enforced that's enforced at the end of the transaction an agent won't be paid without those forms being taken care of the problem we have with this is that there's not even a transaction yet. It's just a showing. Well, so listen to what Julie just said. If you sold real estate for more than a blank, you know what we're talking about. So you're when you take the listing, you get the property disclosure form, the lead-based paint form. You get all of the Mickey Mouse signed, right? When you get the listing paperwork signed. That paperwork then is given to the buyer's agent when they're making an offer. They're then signing it. All the paperwork is gathered. And the ultimate catch-all is the transaction uh, won't close until you know whatever CRM you're using says all the paperwork is in, or the listing agent won't be paid their commission until they've uh, collected all the paperwork right. and turned it in. Right. So those are that's the sort of great system that's been in place forever that really does work. Now what they're doing is this is the part we personally think is going to change because it really truly does not make sense. Is they're requiring that a form, not just an agency form sign, where it says, I am a buyer's agent and I represent your buyer. And these are the, res you guys have seen those hopefully, right? Hopefully you're using them because you have to, it's law. So if you now have to have the agency form signed, now you're going to have to have a separate agreement uh, signed where it's going to have a lot of points in it that are going to make you guys nervous to present and going to make the buyers even more nervous to try to understand. It doesn't make sense that there's going to just be an easy, transition from the way it's been for you know droves of years uh, then all of a sudden on the day after where all the stuff yeah. is implemented people are just naturally going to start using all the paperwork very difficult to implement very difficult to enforce i didn't even get into what the potential fines are going to be i'll report on that later but you know there's another weird thing to this right you know how listing agents have different usps right unique selling propositions I charge this and you get that, right? And a lot of those things are a bit proprietary, especially to the most competitive agents who have very specific things, whether they offer staging or they have, you know, maybe an easy exit listing or whatever they're offering that makes them different. Well, by the buyer side now having to disclose and show that they have an agreement, isn't that buyer's agent also show, having to show the world potentially what their deal is? Are they a flat fee agent? Do they have some kind of Swiss army knife of different options? They're kind of sharing their own business practices as well, as well which I think is kind of weird. I, I think there's di many different levels to this. I think, you know, now I'm speculating, but I, I would imagine that there's going to be some digital drop down easy agreement boxes. That's where it's going to go for I sure. I think it has to go that yeah. way because how else can you enforce this? You're going to have to have a digital footprint. There's going to have to be a way that a listing agent can log on to the mothership before they okay showings and this agent has an agreement maybe they don't have to disclose what the agreement is but they at least have well, done the legal responsibility of having an agreement so you read that the uh you're showing a property when you walk in the property with the buyer correct yes okay so if you don't that's have, called touring now I right guess. so it, you, that technically means you should have had some kind of agreement in place yes what if you just open the door and you don't walk in I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, but seriously. There you go. You're on your own. Yeah. Well, I, and then, you know, why why wouldn't they just go to the listing agent? I don't, I don't know. These are all really good questions. Well, the listing agents aren't going to want to have to. I mean, but I think ultimately what you're saying is right. There's going to be some kind. 
the MLSs and all these, you know, there's really a lot of smart people that run the softwares for the MLSs. All these, you know, there's a lot of very innovative uh, solutions. We, we just haven't thought our way through. Fortunately, we don't have to. Other people will do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, it's going to come down to what Julie just said. There's going to be a digitized version that will be automatically updated. Um, that like, like you, maybe register your buyer, right, on some kind of database. And maybe that ties into the e-key. You know how there's different data yeah. that you can get from the e-key so that if I show your listing, I already have front loaded that this is a legit buyer agreement that I have. It could be something like that. I think they're going to have a transition. You know what's crazy? I, as I was doing all this research, and we have all these questions and, you know, the existing FAQs without this ever even being implemented yet is 100 questions long on an AR site. That's without anybody even trying to do any of this stuff. That's before actually people started trying to put all this stuff yeah. in practice. Yeah. And add on that, you know, that our licenses say you're not allowed to practice law. And yet here we are nonstop trying to interpret law. That's kind of a, a bad thing, I think. But I kept, I was having this thought like, gosh, this really feels like when short sales, short sales hit the fan and nobody knew how to do it. That's exactly right. And it took quite a, I mean, I don't think this is going to take nearly as long as that did to get sorted out because there's, there's less moving parts, but there sure are a lot of questions to this. So that brings us to the last two questions. Number eight, what about buyer clients and seller clients and our existing agreements through the transition? Because you're going to have listings that you took in June that aren't sold by August, right? And you didn't have any of this stuff in place. Local MLSs will require either new contracts or amendments, it depends on your MLS, by August 17th. So pay attention to what's being required and make sure that you're compliant. So Julie was just touching on something. She was doing it uh, subconsciously, but the reality of it is, is the greatest fortunes of everyone have always been made during the greatest times of change. And we're in one of these greatest times of change now. So if you've got your act together, brokers, office managers, individual agents, and you're actually able to lead your agents through this confusing time, you're going to dominate the market because everyone's going to, everyone, all your competitors are going to be in panic mode. That's the point of Julie and I talking about this and trying to motivate you to take action on this information so that you're not having to play catch up because August 17th, there is no August 17th and you have 90 days to get your shit together. Nope. It's August 17th and on the 18th, if you're not following these new guidelines, you're probably going to be signing yourselves up for some gnarly problems. So we will strongly suggest you get way ahead of this and align with essentially a company like eXp Realty that's going to have already done the heavy lift for you and you can just ride their wake. And that's, again, the reason why a lot of brokers are moving you over to eXp. Um, so the moral of the story is, is the greatest fortunes have always been made during the greatest times of change. And we're in one of those greatest times of change now. Don't wait for the clouds to clear embrace the clouds, appreciate the fact that you now have an advantage over your competitors because you can take action on this stuff and implement. And really when, again, they're trying to play catch up, you'll already be halfway down the field. Yes. Which leads us to our final point today. Number eight, what should you do now in anticipation of these requirements? Well, Tim, you just covered a lot of that, but certainly join Premier Coaching so you can have and use a buyer presentation, which results in a signed agreement with your buyer clients. And be able to articulate your value with confidence, showing specific, unique selling propositions, and offer much, much more than a buyer can find on their own using online resources. Remember that knowledge equals confidence and ignorance equals fear. So stay informed, stay motivated, and get into action. You guys are going to be okay. I know that you're freaking out. I know this is a lot to digest. It was certainly a lot to research, and there's more where this came from, but you're going to be okay. Well, Julie consolidated what was 100 points on NAR's website down to less than 20, so good job, Julie. (laughs) Thank you. It was a heavy lift. But I'm going to say this too. Um, Don't fear all of this for all the reasons we've been telling you, but I'll tell you the biggest reason why. This is no way any sort of like, you know, death rattle for the real estate industry, not even close. We've gone through so much. Julie and I have been in this industry for almost, I mean, you know, 25 years. And there have been so many things that have been equally as daunting to understand as all this stuff. This is nothing. The industry adapts. And I'll tell you the reason why you are, you know, you, you were and still are hopefully, uh, you know, smart enough to have gotten a real estate license and now hopefully smart enough to actually embrace the fact that you are a licensee. Um, is that you are selling something that everybody needs and wants and always will. You're not selling something that's going to be obsoleted from AI. You're not selling something where all of a sudden, you know, people are going to decide, you know what, 
the hell with it. I'm going to start living in a cave, right? You're selling <laughs> yeah. something that's always going to be in demand and demographics are the wind at your back. There's more people that want to buy and sell real estate and the numbers are just increasing because the numbers of humans in the United States. Um, and I'm just talking about, you know, millennials and I'm talking about the generations after them. Those numbers are larger. We do not have a shrinking population. We have a growing population. And you can even throw some of the immigrants in there, right? So the reality of it is, is you are in the right place. You are at the right time and you are selling the right product. So go you. Now, please do not operate out of fear. Just remember, ignorance, confidence at confidence and ignorance. Go ahead. Read your knowledge last Knowledge equals line. confidence. <laughs> ignorance equals fear. Yeah. Knowledge equals confidence. Ignorance, ignorance equals fear. So stay informed, stay motivated and get into action. Guys, please know this is your time. If you make it your time, if you decide to be fearful and you decide not to take action, come August 18th, things are going to look not so great for you. So please do not procrastinate. Have a great day. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.